I'll be happy in the afterlife, but not now. It sounds mean to say it, but our family is too large, in a sense. There isn't enough food at the table for everyone. And, to finish the analogy, the distribution of food is controlled by a heckling audience of men who don't know which of us brought the food to the table in the first place. If you've read this whole volume, you will understand. But you are likely one of very few readers to even lay eyes on the first page. For history, I must report that I have been appointed Praetor for all Greece and Macedonia. My first legitimate office since my technically never annulled consulship began all those years ago. But I have one superior in this office, the one made consul for the same portion of the Empire, my young and increasingly pointless nephew Eutropius. I think I would get along well with him, were he not the son of Constance. He reeks of his father. He was coddled to be his father, as my father coddled Constance. And suffice to say, my prospects for him are dark. But what I think doesn't matter. Yes, that is the lesson of this volume, of this life. I was spurned by the world for doing right by my family, then spurned by my family for doing right by the people, and finally, at last, spurned by the people too, for a mad liar named Julianus undid my work in all of their memories. Health and an army, that is what I'm left with, and I intend to use both to aid everyone who destroyed my legacy. Why? because the gods wish this empire to flourish, and I will not be spurned by them. Welcome back to Fields of Mars. Last time we saw Uther moving out to take Lugdunum from the Alamans, a nice defensive position. Then we saw one of our reserve armies struggling to fight with a Hun stack, but eventually succeeding despite heavy losses. We then saw more action against the Huns when Julianus semi-accidentally ambushed them, destroying another of their main armies. The Lachmids multiple times last time attacked our settlements in Egypt, constantly sacking them, so that's annoying. Septimus found himself a nice opportunity to take Caesarea Eusebia by drawing their garrison out into a battle and then destroying them, which he did pretty easily. And then we almost lost Lugdunum again when the Alamans bypassed Uther, but luckily, again, they only sacked it. So we're now continuing that intern sequence after the Lugdunum sacking and the Garamantians finally take Oxyrhynchus after it's been sacked a billion times by the Lachmans. There were no defenders, they just walked on in. Very inconvenient, we'll have to look at that in a second. Now we've got Arya attacking us at Sinope with a full stack. We've even got four units in the garrison, unfortunately. Now I sat here at first thinking, can we win this? Maybe it's actually possible, but uh, immediately saw those large onagers and was like, wait a minute, I know what's going to happen here. Might as well auto resolve. The only question left after that was would they occupy it? And the answer is that they wouldn't. So that is handy. I thought I'd gotten away with it there. We'll still have the settlement. But in the next turn, you can see it's actually been taken over by rebels. I guess public order was that low and there's no garrison that they just kind of spawned in the settlement and had it. So that was annoying. However, you may remember I also had Eutropius moving to Sinope to start reinforcing in this theatre. So I'm just going to go and have him attack it right now. The Aryans who are standing right there can't reinforce this because they're technically also going to be at war with this rebel faction. So we can just kill this couple of units for free, basically easy peasy. And the Aryans will even be forced back a bit by this because it will make them go out of the zone of control once we occupy the settlement. So we did get Sinope back in the end. We did keep it after all, although only thanks to Eutropius. He can now sit there and defend it against the Aryans if they want to take it. And I think they're just going to walk away, actually, in the next end turn sequence. So back down south in Egypt, Anisius needed to move out to go and challenge the Garamantians for Otsirinkas. Annoyingly, he couldn't quite move there, so he just got stuck on the outside of town. I guess he was procrastinating actually going in to make that attack, so he can just look at them for now and hopefully in the future we'll manage to take it back. Another big move we're going to be making at this 
this point in the campaign is bringing Aurelianus down towards Anatolia. It's finally time for him to get out of fighting the Huns and get out of holding rebellions down all over Macedonia and Greece. He is going to come to the front line to try and get some glory and action. Julianus was chasing some Huns last time and he finally caught up with them now after taking some attrition running through winter to get to these guys. The enemy weren't all that powerful, it's two half armies basically. I wanted a better balance bar here so I was considering actually bothering to fight this to avoid losses but since there's no prospect of fighting a battle after this I didn't really mind the losses. Gonna throw down that quick save because I do not trust the auto resolve of course and we'll just see what happens we'll go for it. It's a nice chance to kill two armies at the same time which is uh, handy since they're always running away. Unfortunately we didn't wipe them out entirely so we are still going to have to chase them. They will at least as they run away from this take some attrition running through the snow so I'm pretty sure it's just a handful of guys in each army now but they can still raid and apply the full raiding penalty because of how that mechanic works so we do need to get rid of them at some point and there are also more huns up to the far northeast which we can't actually see right now because we haven't discovered their base but they are up there somewhere we'll take them out later now Septimus has finally got a chance to complete the strategic objective he had in this region of taking Ankara. I'm going to do it with the help of Eutropius. First he comes in to besiege Ankara and you can see from the balance board there he probably has a chance of just taking it on his own but with Eutropius we can make life easier. First we're going to march through the snow taking some attrition to take out all of the reinforcements from Atropatane there so that'll lessen the enemy of the balance bar presence and because Septimus has the city under siege the garrison and isn't allowed to take part in this fight so that's just going to be an easy order result very nice a classic exploit ish tactic because you can uh, actually have the siege with just one man and it will stop the garrison coming out so you can exploit that pretty heavily if you want Eutropius will be left in attrition there which is a shame but we'll just take that as the price for the great auto resolve we can get now on Ankara. You can see there the balance bar super far in our favour. The enemy's army was mostly just trash although they did have a high level governor inside so that's nice to be taking him out. Not that it really matters because the Sassanids probably have an infinite supply of high level governors available to them. So we will occupy this settlement. It should make a nice defensive position if we lose Caesarea Eusebia which is a decent chance we will because it's really out there and it may help us control the province of Abyssinia as well since we control Sinope if we ever get the money time and resources to actually build this place up out of its wrecked state. You look exactly as I remembered and you look significantly worse. The saddest conqueror this city's seen in a while no doubt. I've had a tough time on my own. Too much bathing in gold and women must be exhausting. No wonder it's taken you so long to get this far. This is not a joking matter. Look, I'm not going to talk about it now. I wasn't joking. That's the story in Rome. We noted how your territories owe quite a lot in tax and tribute. Has to be going somewhere. We noted? You just marched through these lands to get here. There is no tribute to give. More graveyards than farmyards. And isn't it your land now anyway, consul? You've got a lot of weight to pull, little brother. In the next turn, there was a nice opportunity once again to steal some territory from the Sassanids. Iconium had a army in it for as long as I can remember, basically, and finally it didn't once we were in position to actually attack it. So the Sassanids are falling back, it seems, abandoning many of their garrisons in this area. And we will exploit that by just taking this hillman right now. Super easy order to resolve, no problem there. It is, though, in its own province, so it's going to be almost impossible to hold. I need to occupy it anyway, though, because of the winter attrition. This is just some for Septimus to shelter and it's even already got a big rebel army in it so yeah really on the edge we may not actually stay there for long. Now it's time for Anisius to make this attack against Oxyrhynchus and the Garamantian king no less happens to be inside with an army that's mostly trash although a small number of regiments of decent spearmen who we may have to worry a tiny bit about. This battle actually went not as I expected right from the very beginning because the enemy army charged out of the settlement as I started it and I had set up for a siege assault with groups in various points around the settlement ready to make small attacks so they're really catching us off guard and they almost cavalry charged these exposed archers. They uh, gave up at the last second just because this is a jab camp unit they're probably on skirmish mode so they turn back but if they had just ran right through the archers that would have done a lot more than their javelins did 
Here comes some actual cavalry though. Luckily these guys were targeting my onagers and the onager siege pieces themselves block most of the charge along with all these weird fences around the place. So that was handy. It went a lot less bad than it could have, that surprise attack. And now we can start to take revenge. Anisius happens to be there with the Praetorian cavalry so they'll just annihilate those lesser cavalry. And the rest of our army is going to scramble into some kind of formation. This group on the east side of town is going to have to stay separate to the rest of the army. They're just too far away. And the enemy is going to split off a small force to attack them. And the king was actually included among that number. So we're going to try and take him out here. We've got enough units to surround him. And I've got some spearmen who are just going to chase after him now and try and get him into melee. Our swords will do okay against him as well. We'll lock him down in position there. And we'll now just attack from all sides with everything we have here. A nice chance to take out their leader while the rest of their army makes its way towards us. Their initial cavalry charge has now basically been dealt with. We sorted them out, reformed some lines, and now we'll receive all of our infantry, of which there is tons, but the enemy kind of grouped it up, as you can see there, into one giant blob for the most part. And that means it's a waste, really. They, they're not using their numbers. Most of their men won't be fighting, and it's a nice target for our archers, or at least it would be if we could fight in an arced pattern. We're just shooting our own men, probably, there. Anyway, these small groups that are separate from the main blob are easy enough to just surround and take out. Most of these guys aren't really good in melee anyway. And all of the stuff on the east side of the town was just completely annihilated. And we can bring all those forces now to do a gigantic sandwich against the enemy. They are going to be in trouble. And our swordsmen just need to hold their position there until all of the sandwiching forces arrive. And we are going to take some losses. As I said, they have some somewhat decent spears among their number who will do okay against our guys, uh, mainly just because they have so much stuff there they'll eventually inflict damage by sheer numbers sheer attrition did get a couple of nice onager shots there but I actually didn't want to use my onagers even though there's this nice blob because you can tell the onagers to target the blob but if like you happen to click on a unit that has one man at the front your onagers might just shoot your own men and we've learned from previous battles that the onagers can do devastating damage to your own men and I think we're going to be fine to take out this blob conventionally because here comes the gigantic surround we're just going to be rear flanking everything and their formation is such a mess this probably will count as a rear flank and a side flank against every single unit all at the same time and that's going to do some morale damage as you can see the blob starts disintegrating and as it does I just charge with everything sending in all the archers all the cavalry to just hit as much as possible we don't actually need to be slaughtering the enemy here because in siege attack battles the enemy are just deleted uh, regardless of what you actually did in the battle as long as you win. So we're not going to chase them down. Absolutely glitching out. I think there's just too much unit collision going on. It's screwing with the lighting for some reason. I don't know, maybe the gods are trying to put on some sort of show in celebration of this gigantic victory and the death of the Garamantian king. That's a decisive victory for Anisius. Another battle where it looked a tiny bit hairy, but he just kind of pulled through somehow. It just all worked out in the end. So let's take a look at the final result. You can guess what it's going to be on the enemy side. Everything completely dead, as I suggested. On our side, no full units lost. That's great. A few units down to low strength because of the enemy having a few semi-decent troops among them. But nothing to worry about right now. We don't have any impending battles, so we can surely get them back before the next fight. Now I noticed I could liberate Oxyrhynchus, which was an interesting idea because then I wouldn't have to hold it myself and the liberated faction would probably have a full stack here. But I thought I'd actually rather do that if I can at Berenice because that's much harder to hold than Oxyrhynchus because it's so far away from everything. So I'm thinking I might let Berenice be taken by the Lacomins or something and then try and liberate it rather than bothering to control all of Egyptus myself just because we don't have the resources to do it at this point. So that's the plan. We'll see what happens with that. Now the Lachmans actually send some forces towards Alexandria and then this other faction, the Abashar faction that you don't see all that much, one of the many puppet states, comes to join them and then Arya comes to attack Caesarea Eusebia. We've got, well, two units, four half units inside to defend, so not all that much, but I actually tried to fight this one myself because I thought if the enemy don't destroy the walls, we might actually be able to kill loads of them using the towers, like if we can just choke point them in a single gate or something like that. Unfortunately, the AI was having a good day. They did have two sets of large onagers, which basically just completely wrecked everything inside and outside of the town, and there wasn't an enormous amount we could do with only a small number of infantry and the enemy's entire army just standing there. So we pretty much lost everything. We'll skip out the rest of that fight. The enemy took it no problem. 
Uh, we did do a lot of damage to their cavalry, but that's not necessarily going to matter because it'll just regenerate. Didn't get any full units there. They didn't even take the southern one, they just sacked it. So this is another case where I thought I'd kept it, but it's also another case where rebels just uh, stepped in and captured it instead. So once again, we've been screwed over by the rebels. Only this time the rebel army is actually pretty big, so we can't just quickly auto resolve to get it back. So that's inconvenient. But I guess I expected to lose Caesarea Eusebia in the end. And it actually provides a pretty decent buffer zone now between us and the Sassanids to the southeast. So we'll just leave them to it. As we approached the edge of town, it was strangely quiet. No force appeared to meet us. General Postumus retired to his tent while the preparations for a siege were made. As the men sat to wait out the first of what could be many days, there was a roar and a rumble. The Garamantian king and his followers stormed towards us without warning. The men scrambled, but too slowly. It seemed that the spearhead of horsemen would crash through our thinly cast lines of shields. But with a beaming grin, the general rode out and met the enemy before they arrived, slashing this way and that with skill and courage. His troops, rallying to him, surrounded the foe, and with a great series of heavenly flashes, the moment of victory was marked. He had done it again. Our fortunes here in Anatolia should improve because Aurelianus, bringing his force of elite troops, has finally arrived to take part in the fighting and he's going to waste absolutely no time quickly storming one of the Sassanid minor settlements. Gigantic garrison of absolute trash inside. They will be swept aside to capture the settlement. Now with this town, it's in its own region, I think this is part of the Asian province, and I didn't know whether I should occupy it. I considered for a pretty long time just sacking it to weaken the Sassanids and taking the money, which we could use. But in the end, I decided to occupy it with sort of wishful thinking, really, hoping we could somehow hold this province. I mean, we might eventually take other regions in it. Maybe not, it's just a place we need to be prepared to rebel at some point. At the very least, we are denying it from the Sassanids, so they won't be able to use it. And if we take enough Sassanid stuff, we might be able to force a food shortage on them or something like that, which would be very nice. Now, Septimus is going to team up with Eutropius once again to do a bit more important work. First, I moved to attack the Aryan army standing near Caesarea Eusebia. It just ran away behind the settlement, so we can't go after them right now. But I'm now actually stuck in the settlement zone of control, so I have to attack it. I didn't initially plan to do it, but now I saw the balance bar. I was like, all oh, right, that's fine. I had forgotten that they're going to have no garrison since they only just took it. So actually, it's going to be really easy to quickly take it back, despite my earlier claims of it being more difficult than before. I didn't think it really is, especially because we actually have two armies coming in to do it. So we'll quickly take it. Their army is strangely siege-based, so I didn't want to take the usual protective stance because I thought the AI might give um, the enemy army a big ranged advantage because of all those large onagers. Anyway, we're going to take it with uh, relatively low losses. We'll move right back in. Once again, shifting that front line forwards and giving us some walls to defend, albeit completely ruined walls at this point after all these battles. And Eutropius just going to step back to take out some Atropatane forces who didn't even run away from his gigantic army, so I guess they were fine with being wiped out. Now, you might be wondering where all the Sassanids are. In the past, whenever we stepped towards the Sassanids, they just attacked us with four or five stacks instantly. And it seems they're here, basically. We found them just one province away, waiting around. I'm not sure if they're waiting to attack us, and they might have been there for a very long time since they haven't shown up in ages. So, at least we know they are still there. We can't just attack with reckless abandon or anything. We'll have to keep them in mind. Now, Anisius needs to take down some Egyptian rebels. It seems the locals want to form the Egyptian faction so much they're willing to try it themselves, but we're going to take them down, even though they probably could defend the place better than we can. We want to keep our control over the region, so that's goodbye to them. Now, Julianus is finally returning back to Italia after his tour of the Hunnic land, slaying all he saw, and on his return, he's got two more armies to take down. A nice chance to finish off these two half-dead forces, because that will just stop them from raiding, it stops them from blocking replenishment because of the Hun bonus thing, and what better place to defeat a couple of Hun armies than just over the border of Italia. So that might even have been the first time the Huns actually came into Italia, I can't remember, I think they must have trodden it before while pursuing us around the border. But hopefully this can be spanned as a pretty big publicity victory for Julianus. You might see there that there are plenty of rebel armies all over the place, these are the guys Julianus would previously have been responsible for taking down 
around, but he just wasn't here. So we've got rebels everywhere. Luckily, these Celtic rebels, for some reason, don't work like normal rebels. They don't recruit troops. They just become a horde instantly and walk around with a couple of units, which meant we weren't losing Italia to all these rebellions. And I really don't know why, but we'll just exploit that. Coming in now to quickly kill two rebel armies at once. Another big publicity victory for Julianus, no doubt. His return has been very successful, and we can even sneak into a settlement to get some replenishment, avoiding the disease in that other settlement to the northeast. So that is all well and good. Hopefully now he can defend Italia against future rebellions, which there probably will be some of, since there is such bad public order all over the place. We proceeded into the town square, rushed on by a powerful current of citizenry gathering there to meet us. They saw the carts of Hun spoils, the blackened armor and gilded saddles, but it was not the wealth they focused on. It was the collection of heads of all the Hunnic nobility we had crushed on our campaign. Those heads were the guarantee of the people's safety, and although quite unsavory, they became idols of worship in an instant. All were begging any they knew who could read to purchase one of the many copies of my campaign diaries I had prepared before my return. Written by the peoples of the frontier themselves, a true history of a world-changing general, and rightfully their consul too. It was a scene unlike any other. We'll take a look at Uther's problems now, and his big problem is that we've got an Alaman army coming down towards Turinum. Now, Turinum is the place where we have the garrison building, because I kept fighting rebels there. So we've got a large amount of troops inside ready to face them. I'm considering here upgrading it. It won't help now because it takes too long. But realize I probably do have the food to make this garrison even bigger if we need to increase our defenses in the future. But that aside, right now we need to decide, should Uther move to Turinum? He can do so. He could go and defend it. But doing that will leave him open to so many different directions. The bad thing about Lugtonum is that it's neighbouring tons of other regions. There's loads of roads going to it. So it can be attacked just from anything, basically. Even those rebels just off to the east there would be enough to take it because it only has a couple of units in its garrison. So to help me decide, I was desperately hoping for a spy to be somewhere available, but past me wasn't so kind. I decided to hire a new spy for future use in these endeavours. What I can even do if I can hack through all these news messages that always randomly pop up is move the spy through the city because that doesn't cost any movement points and I almost got vision on the next settlement over to see if anything was there not quite though however I am just going to wait for now because Lugdunum is more important than Turinum in the long run I discovered the Huns' last outpost there on the far frontier of the map. They've got a couple of armies hanging around, not causing any trouble right now at least. And the Alamans do indeed attack Turinum as it looked like they were going to. So we're going to get our big garrison here, balance bar in the enemy's favour. And that's mainly going to be because the enemy's melee units, those Germanic Spearmasters, are way better than all of our melee stuff. And they have tons of those crossbowmen who are good against armoured units, which is what most of the Roman strength is concentrated in. Now for this battle, to make it a bit more interesting, I thought I'd try an avant-garde tactic. We're just going to abandon the town right as the battle starts in order to go across this bridge and then use the bridge as a nice choke point. That does of course mean the enemy will be able to capture the town, but in the small settlement battles, capturing the town doesn't matter. I think it gives you a morale bonus controlling the capture point. It might even be a morale bonus only if you're standing on the capture point. That might have been Rome too, something like that. So anyway, we can abandon the town safely and force them to attack us, and they're going to do so with their cavalry to start with. The worst choice, basically, since I can put a line of shields and spears on the bridge and they can't possibly get past it. And we're in stationary to studio, which cancels out the enemy's charge, so the enemy just stop when they reach us, and now they'll have to fight a melee against spears, so that's good for us. I have left a small detachment on the other side of the river, my cavalry and light infantry, just to have a little mobile element to cause some trouble if we can later on. In the meantime though, it's just going to be a grind. We don't have anything to do as the player, the enemy are just fighting the one unit we have at the front and we'll just watch and see how it goes. Eventually they'll start bringing all their infantry into the fight as well. And a lot of those crossbows that they have are going to be kind of wasted here because the exact way the enemy has to form up to attack across a bridge, that being a column, kind of blocks the line of sight of most of the crossbows so they don't really do anything half the time so that's handy and a lot of them actually ended up getting drawn into the melee which was even better so the enemy's melee infantry is better as i said but 
we have more melee infantry, so it's just going to be a grind. We've got loads of units waiting to take their place at the bridgehead, and we'll just have to see if we win. We can't do any tactics. We don't really have any uh, special moves we can do, at least regarding the bridge. We can use our cavalry that we left behind to harass the enemy, because the enemy didn't attack with everything for whatever reason. Their onagers and some of their crossbow units stayed behind, including these guys who were just queuing up down the road for whatever reason. They're going to get their act together soon enough. So yeah, we'll take out their onagers and try and damage their crossbows. And the fact that I'm doing some antics draws some of the units back away from the attack to come back into the town. So that'll lessen the pressure on our front line. I don't think that'll make a big difference to the front line engagement though. You can see I'm running away from this unit before it's been defeated and that was where I realized this replay is not going to be accurate <laughs> to what happened in the battle because we might as well have taken down those crossbows and I'm pretty sure I actually did in the fight. So yes, this replay is going to be a bit corrupt but you can see the vague notion of what I'm doing here. We'll take out all of these exposed crossbows and onager crews, that'll be easy enough, and just leave the grind to grind away. The question is, will we lose everything before they lose everything? It's a straight brute force melee fight with not much we can do and not much the enemy can do either. What I'm actually going to do is, because this replay gets increasingly corrupt from this point, I ended up stop stopping uh, filming it because it just went completely off the rails. So we'll come back next time with my backup footage of the the, uh, live recording of me doing the battle to cover a few more interesting events in this very long fight. The territories illegally captured by Constans and his sons were being brought back into the fold year by year, receiving once again their rights to full Roman citizenship and their obligations to provide funds to state organizations. This, combined with the wars against the Eastern powers being moved to more foreign battlegrounds, meant that real stability was returning to the Empire. The time for rebellions and change was passing, and the order that once had shattered was being pieced back together bit by bit. The end of the world seemed to have come and gone, and with it went some of the appeal of the larger religions and their promises of various kinds of salvation. There would still be wars and upheavals to come, but for a resident of Rome or Londinium, life was as good as it could be. So that is all for this episode. Thank you so much for watching, and thanks to the off -ED patrons for making this video happen. So we'll have lots of ups and downs the rest of that battle, and in fact a whole new war to fight in the next episode of Fields of Mars.